My name is Wade. I'm the assistant curator on this show. Uh, thank you so much to Helene and Giannis for uh, having us. It's been a real pleasure and a real treat. Um, and thank you so much, Patrick, for setting up this talk a little bit and for your kind words. I, I really appreciate it. Phenomenology and protocol, power and paranoia in the age of the hyper real. As Patrick started to, li to uh, outline, today there is no thought or action that is not defined by some kind of protocol, be it written in code or enforced by the laws of physics. For decades, thinkers have been exploring the effects of protocols made manifest by hardware, software, and other digital technologies on human cognition. Recently, a staggering global rise in disinformation, algorithms of oppression, and data surveillance technologies have helped facilitate an era of hyper-reality. We see this in algorithmic technologies that discriminate based on race, such as predictive criminology software, or even airport risk flagging systems. We see this in the development of alt-right movements around the world, and disinformation leading to skewed elections and rises in populism. And we also see this in the kind of sophisticated predictive marketing technologies that tell us what we want before we have even had a chance to conceive of it. Not only is it increasingly difficult to determine what is real and what isn't, the difference is starting to lose meaning. We live in a semiotic society where anything that is presented as visible is beginning to be understood as true across continents and borders. In this talk, I'm going to use art historical and anthropological lenses to help describe how we got here. I specifically draw on ideas put forth by a number of scholars, but I do want to preface that this is still research in progress and in no way exhaustive or complete. I wanted to present this to you because I think these ideas are really important to, for understanding our networked world right now. So thanks everybody for taking a leap with me. I really appreciate you coming along for the journey and figuring out what just makes our reality our reality. So what's the issue here and where are we? Um, anyone reading the news or participating on social media probably has a good impression of the kind of cognitive dissonance that has become a routine aspect of contemporary life in the Western world. What we read isn't always what we know to be true, and the mismatch of beliefs, value systems, and apparent evidence is coming to a head globally. Jean Baudrillard describes this phenomenon as hyperreality, or our inability to tell the difference between reality and a simulation of reality. In our advanced technological society and with the advent of more complex social communication networks, what is real and what is fictitious becomes blended together so that it is, it is nearly impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. This is interesting because, as a number of thinkers have pointed out, this sort of turns the binary between real and fake totally on its head. And over the course of this talk, I'm going to argue that the difference is beginning to lose meaning. What does real even mean, after all? In popular culture, this phenomenon was explored by experimental documentarist Adam Curtis in his BBC film Hypernormalization. In his description of the film, Curtis writes that hypernormalization wades through the culmination of forces that have driven this culture into mass uncertainty, confusion, spectacle, and simulation. Where events keep happening that seem crazy, inexplicable, and out of control, this film shows a basis to not only why these chaotic events are happening, but also why we, as well as those in power, may not understand them. We have retreated into a simplified and often completely fake version of the world, and because it is reflected all around us, ubiquitous, we accept it as normal. I have been particularly struck by how these ideas represent currents in the, art world, in the world of visual arts, particularly in the recent rises in cryptocurrency and art object NFTs. Behind me on screen, you can see works by, uh, by Beeple, um, who famously sold uh, his NFT for $69 million at Christie's auction. Crypto has been lauded as the savior of the art world and the champion of the underrepresented artist. Creators from all sectors have been flocking to sites like Nifty Gateway Foundation and Hiket Nuuk, and evangelism for this burgeoning technology is at an all-time high. We're even beginning to see major brands join in to tell the world that you too can get quick, rich quick off NFTs. Just this week, Pepsi announced an NFT launch and we watched both Facebook slash Meta and Budweiser interact with them on Twitter, fully adopting and appropriating the language that the NFT community has developed to communicate with one another.
But I want to take a step back because the art world has been adapting to, the, adapting to these ideas about hyperreality for a long time now. I know we've been talking a lot about society and our world, but I think by looking to history of visual culture, we might be able to glean some insights that help us to dissect what's going on and how we got here. In his famous text, Dispersion, Seth Price wrote that the problem arises when the constellation of critique, publicity, and discussion around the work, uh, an artwork, is at least as charged as a primary experience of the work. What happens when a more intimate, thoughtful, and enduring understanding comes from mediated representations of an exhibition or artwork rather than from a direct experience? We've seen that virtual experiences are beginning to displace physical ones. It's the representation of an idea that matters today rather than the physical material of that work. And I think that the perfect example of this is honestly the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is one of the most famous, reproduced, and circulated images on the planet. We see da Vinci's famous painting on mugs, t-shirts, iPhone covers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go to the Louvre in Paris, rather than having this like transcendent and spiritual experience of beauty, the reality looks a little bit more like this. Um, the, the space is crowded, it's overwhelmed with tourists, most people are actually just trying to get a picture of it with their cameras, and you're kind of kept away at a 15 uh, foot distance. You can't really approach the work physically at all. This is a work whose circulation value has totally exceeded its exhibition value. The aura of the work is no longer in the work itself, but rather in its ability to spread and create new meaning in each dispersion. Here, the value of the Mona Lisa is not the, the painting of the is not the painting itself, but rather the the idea of the work, its own simulation. This is helpful. Uh, and Boris Groys talks about digital images as being uh, newly performed um, every time they are loaded or displayed. Each interaction with a digital image is a new performance based on the interaction between file, hardware, and software interface. And I think this is really helpful in thinking through how each encounter that we have with an image, symbol, or simulation is affective on our cognition as human beings who experience the world through our senses. So at this point, um, importantly, our relationship to technology and protocols that define how those, history, how those technologies work are central to the story. So let's take a look back on art history of the past, past few decades to ground us a little bit as we think through this. In the 60s and 70s, there was a generation of computer artists uh, experimenting with ways to use computer systems to create images for the first time. Notable pioneers like Michael Knoll, Manfred Moore, and Lillian Schwartz were finding artistic partners in computers for the first time. These images that you see on screen come from some of Lillian Schwartz's first experiments with computer-made images. For the first time, a brand new type of image was being created that was uniquely rooted in the logic of the computer. This was a new aesthetic, one that could only be created through computers and the way that machine logic creates images in pixels on screen. While these kinds of glitchy, colorful images are super popular today and we see them all the time, this was the first time that the world had seen this. This was brand new. In the 80s, we saw the rise of the pictures generation, which was a whole era of artists employing appropriation to experiment not only with how they could interfere with the circulation and thus meaning of images, but also how they could use these techniques to craft their own narratives. Like in the top left, we see Cindy Sherman creating characters through dramatic fictitious self-portraiture, copying the visual logic of major motion pictures in ways that simulated how stories were told in this 20th century. In the middle, we see Sherry Levine appropriating phot photographic work by Walker Evans and thus changing his original intent of documenting the people of the Great Depression and inscribing new meaning on those stories. And then in the upper right hand corner we see Barbara Kruger's work which is honestly what I consider to be some of the original memes where she has taken somewhat propagandistic advertising imagery and used language to reorient how we interact with those symbols in ways that align with a more feminist and socially just mindset. Then in the 90s, we kind of get more to where our story really begins, uh, which was the advent of net art, because home computers became affordable and available for the first time. I'm super excited to be talking about this with net art legends Pat Lichty and uh, here, uh, here with us today as we talk about how this part of our history fits into the story. The kinds of connections and reinscriptions of meaning through collage and appropriation became manifest in this era. As digital art curator Christiana Paul wrote, links made it possible to connect text and visuals to the contextual network in which they are embedded and to visualize a network of references that would normally be separated by physical space. In hyperlinking, people could construct new realities. For instance, in Cameron Askin's famous piece, Cameron'sWorld.net, the artists used hyperlinks to connect hundreds, if not thousands, of different personal ecosystems on the now defunct site GeoCities into his own web page world. 
This new world contained elements of all of its constituent pieces and was a new vision unique to Cameron's own sensibilities, his own kind of web reality. We saw this desire to create our own web world expand with the surf clubs of the first decade of the new millennium. Sites like Super Central, Spirit Surfers, and Nasty Nets were blogs where artists could come together and share things that they found online in ways that predate modern social media. These artists collectively created narratives around bits of net detritus that they found, collated, and worked together to build artworks and community spaces that were, again, totally separate from the meaning of their individual constituent elements. Importantly, these surfers use the act of searching the web as a, as a central part of their practice. And as you see on screen in this quote from Travis Hallenbeck on the blog Spirit Surfers, he created a definition for this practice which leans on the metaphysical. To him, surfing is an analogy described the ease with which an expert user can use the waves of information flowing around the internet to get where they want. Curator and writer C.C. Moss later wrote that these surf clubs occupied an anthropological approach to the popular culture of social media, which subsequently developed into a larger desire to excavate the web's involvement in the everyday at a moment when the internet became more mobile and integrated into daily life. And more importantly, that for the surf clubs, searching was equivalent to making a form of craft. For the first time, people really understood how hypermedia and its various affects could be used to create meaning. By searching the web, appropriating materials, reinscribing that material in new contexts, one could make tangible impacts on how that material was understood and thus have real impacts on knowledge and society. Uh, the scholar N. Catherine Hills talks a lot about this in her book Cybertext and how reading information on different technological inf uh, interfaces has a profound impact on how we know what it contains. But it was at this time that the internet was also changing. This was at the, around 2008 to 2010, uh, and the web 2.0 uh, era was finally upon us. The days of a relatively in independent internet, the one described by John Perry Barlow, uh, was gone. This was an era defined by, and is still an era, defined by corporate presence and an utter saturation of commercialized, extractive capitalist content. In 2012, as blogs and web pages made way for feed-based algorithmic platforms like MySpace, Facebook, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram, Jesse Darling described the state of the web like this. Social media is to the read-write web what sprawl is to the metropolis of modernity, a homogenous, cancerous, rhizomatic junk space that expands exponentially outward on a sludgy wave of strip malls and sponsored links, greed, and induced demand. This begins to describe the situation that I outlined at the beginning of this talk. This is where we are now. Since Starling wrote this in 2012, honestly, the situation's only become more complicated. So where does that leave us now in the tra trajectory of new media art? In 2019, C.C. Moss, who we just heard from earlier, described the phenomenon of expanded internet art, an understanding that takes a post-digital, post-internet understanding as its baseline. She writes that an expanded internet artwork is not inert and closed, but constantly evolving within its network situation, constantly negotiating the different supports that enable its movement. An expanded artwork reproduces, travels, and accelerates across different spaces and forms, always reconstituting itself, circulating, assembling, and dispersing. Beyond the art world, I think this is also a crucial way of understanding how all media works today. Meaning is no longer fixed, but constantly shifting dependent on context. So at this point, um, now that we have some history under our belts, uh, I want to talk about through some theory that I think will help us through this idea of hyperreality and protocol control. Alexander Galloway described protocol uh, by an opaque lack of freedom in online spaces, arguing that technology constricts us into understanding the world in very specific ways through mechanisms of control. Control is important, but to me, protocol is a bit more than that. For instance, we have internet protocol, which determines how our computers communicate with each other, but we also have protocols like gravity that determine literally how we move through space. I'm you know, sitting in this chair, I'm not floating <laughs> above. For a few minutes, let's look into anthropology for some tools. In the 70s, uh, in his article, Body Techniques, Marcel Most described how t knowledge about the world is physically inscribed in physical techniques of the body. And this was carried on in 2001 by Jean-Pierre Warnier in his text, A Praxeological Approach to Subjectivation in a Material World. Oh my god, that's a mouthful. These texts explain that everything that we know, we know through our bodies, and moreover, that everything we do with our bodies, from walking to holding a fork to riding our computers to speaking, is socially constructed. We learn it from one another. 
And while biology and physics may present some protocols that influence and shape techniques of the body, the current manifestation of these body techniques are created by people beyond natural imperatives and functions. Body techniques help us to understand what I think is the most important tool that we have for dissecting the hyperreal, and that's phenomenology. In his 1994 book, A Phenomenology of Landscape, Chris Tilley explains how a, phenomenal, a phenomenological approach to thinking about landscapes is vital in order to understand how people exist in the world and space. Phenomenology reinscribes in space the relationship between the human body, agency, temporality, and social, and social production. This is a perspective which culminates in the understanding and descriptions of things as they are experienced by a subject. And defined by Tilly, phenomenology is the relationship between being and being in the world. Altogether, we can understand ourselves as experience everything through our senses, which we activate through techniques of our body. There is no other way of understanding the world outside of what we experience. Importantly, this perspective applies across all spaces, places, and modes of being. And I think that in our contemporary era, there's a lot of rhetoric about how you know, for instance, the online isn't real. We hear all the time, what you see on Instagram isn't real. It's not real. It's just Instagram. It's just Tumblr. It's just something that you saw online. But as uh, anthropologist Tom Belstorff describes in his ethnography of the virtual world Second Life, that this is a fallacy. The online is just as real as the offline. Rather than opposing the virtual to the real, we need to oppose the virtual to the actual. In this case, virtual meaning digital and actual meaning physical. Both are real, just constituted by different material conditions. As we saw in Facebook's outage, this, uh, the online uh, and its uh, in unavailability uh, had devastating impacts on global economies. As Belstorff puts it, the virtual and the actual are not reducible to each other, even in their mutual constitution. And it's true, the online and the offline do mutually constitute one another, and both are vital pieces in how we understand the world and ourselves today. Scholars have been thinking about the effects of the digital on us for decades, and what we've come to is an understanding that the material logic of digital systems have a profound impact on how they convey meaning to us. We can't dissociate technology from the information that it carries. Blanchett points, this out, points out that digital information cannot exist without the physical devices that manipulate, store, and exchange them. Computing systems are suffused through and through with the constraints of the materiality. But even a decade before them, Lev Manovich theorized that the logic of a computer can be expected to significantly influence the cultural logic of media. To exemplify this, let's look to the example of our own computer home screens. Uh, we have files, folders, desktops, and even a recycling bin. These are ideas and symbols from white collar working environments uh, from the, and show how the logic of the white men who originally developed this software and hardware uh, uh, continues to have an impact on how we understand the world today through this very Western, very white, very male, uh, white collar labor lens. Galloway wrote all about this in his 2012 book, The Interface Effect, and he describes interfaces really as those transparent devices that achieve the more, the less they do. While seemingly invisible, the protocols that interfaces impose have profound impacts on how we use technology. We just saw this in the example of the desktop and it's homage again to the office environment. In Galloway's words, these things become as naturalized as air or as common as dirt. And this is dangerous and connects back to Curtis's theory of hypernormalization. These invisible effects shape everything that we do and know to be true, and we don't even know that it's happening. This brings me to my final theoretical consideration and the scholarship that inspires the title of this talk. Uh, in 2006, uh, Wendy Hui Kyung Chun wrote Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber Optics. And this is an incredible book that takes uh, a really refreshing, realist uh, approach to understanding how technological systems and their impacts and how technological in systems impact society. Um, in dialogue with Galloway's later writing on interfaces, Chun wrote that your screen with its windows and background suggests that your computer only sends and receives data at your request. It suggests that you are an all-powerful user, uh, Microsoft Invoke, to sell its Internet Explorer by asking, where do you want to go today? <laughs> She goes on to describe how internet protocol is so much more obscure than we realize. Our computers constantly wander without us and send, receive, store, and discard packets of information without us even knowing it. 
There's a whole world of protocol under our noses that we don't even know exists. And ultimately, this is important because as she writes here, digital language makes control systems invisible. We no longer experience the visible yet unverifiable gaze, but a network of non-visualizable digital control. And that seems to be the problem here. Invisible systems of control determine meaning in our world, and we are seemingly powerless to its effects. In our hyperreality, the simulated becomes normalized invisibly because we can't tell the difference, quite frankly. We can't control how disinformation is spread most of the time, and we can't even tell that it's disinformation in the first place. Surveillance algorithms operate against us constantly, and we can't stop them. In order to participate, we have to give over power to their functionality and hope that their masters, if anyone is even in control of those algorithms in the first place, uh, don't have nefarious intentions. And the reason why I love Control and Freedom, though, is that it's a book that's not all doom and gloom. It really does take a realist approach. We don't live in a total control society. The internet is not just a Bentham-esque hellscape, but at, by the same token, the internet is also not the free utopian cyberspace that its early evangelists conceived it as. We're somewhere, the reality is somewhere in the middle. Um, and it's my thesis that in the middle area, between that control and freedom, we as users, as citizens of a world caught in the throes of the hyperreal, have agency. So where does that leave us now? We know that as humans, we are sensing agents who experience the world through our bodies. Phenomenology has a profound, if not the most profound, impact on how we understand. We see this in our hyperreality. When the, when the phenomenology of the real and the simulated are identical, we understand what we feel to be the most sincere form of truth. We also know that protocols define and shape our worlds. Protocols are technological, political, social, and even physical or biological. We must operate within them, and we have to make meaning despite them. So I have like a somewhat radical idea, if you can even call it radical. What if we could change those protocols? What if we could write our own? What if, in building our own worlds, we could create new phenomenologies that offer new ways of meaning, new ways of understanding, and new ways of connecting with one another that cancel out, transform, or otherwise circumnavigate those damaging impacts of a society where reality is what we see and what we feel? If governments, corporations, and whatever other powers that be can use phenomenology as a tool against us, as we saw in the case of anger versus likes on Facebook to control us, uh, we might not be able, then honestly, I think that we can do that too. We, not, we might not be able to change certain technologies, but we can certainly repurpose them to fit our needs. So I'm calling for a new kind of protocol, what I call a worlding protocol. So in the face of looming environmental, social, and economic catastrophe, and this kind of dizzying clash between techno-utopian and techno-fatalistic um, ontologies, there has to be a space outside that is not Western or even human-centric that we can look to. The concept of reworlding asks us to look at every aspect of our world, look to the gray areas in between these competing ideologies, and synthesize something new that works for all of us on an interspecies and intraplanetary level. At the beginning of this talk, I spoke about how the difference between the real and the fake is continuing to lose meaning and might not even matter. And in the era of the hyperreal, we make our reality. We choose what is real and what isn't. And, we, but, and within that, we can use simulation to dream new possibilities, new pathways, and by doing so, wish them into existence. And so if we're talking about rewriting the protocols of our world, let's take a quick look at some of the artists in the show and how they're doing this. In Josefa Njam's Tableau Ciel Fais Contre Terre, the artist looks to science fiction and Afrofuturism, blending ancient ideas and African cultural legacies with new narratives that rely on the affordances of digital archives, 3D modeling software, and network society. As curator Manon Klein wrote, Josefa projects herself into parallel dimensions and future potentials through this kind of narrative simulation. And in the work, you can see her utilize satellite captures of Mount Cameroon amongst other cultural fragments, pygmy chants, uh, different kinds of spiritual totems and artifacts to dissect the hidden or imposed geographies in a conscious exploration of this relationship between representation and imagined reality. We see a somewhat similar endeavor in Morish and Aliari's piece, Physical Tactics for Digital Colonialism, in which the artist created her own digital archive of Syrian and Middle Eastern cultural heritage outside of institutional control. In Nathan Schaefer's Dirigibles of Denali and Wintermoot series, which you see on the wall here, the artist has worked, again, with, uh, as Patrick mentioned, local indigenous communities to create a science fiction comic book series with an attached speculative sci-fi study guide. In, order, in efforts to preserve cultural connections in one of the most ancient networks we know today, the artist is literally writing new mythologies into existence which speak both to the past and future. 
Rather than let the outside world dictate the stories of these indigenous communities, Schaefer has worked with them to tell their own narratives, re reclaiming agency in a world that is starkly hostile to indigenous peoples. In Dina Karadzic's pavilion, the artist works against the rigid internet protocols and firewalls put in place by various governing bodies. The work circumvents the internet using the dark web to locally host tools for the creation of online gallery spaces that exist outside of extractive attention economies, government and corporate surveillance, and any kind of possible censorship. In Mina Chun's piece, we see the artists reject patriarchal protocols, which define our contemporary society, and particularly the North Korean society that she comes from. Instead, the artist is inscribing a new kind of feminist future where a female leader ushers in either, whichever way you look at it, a new era of peace or a new era of world devastation. And I think that these uh, cautionary tales are just as important as uh, the imaginative <coughs> and utopian ones. And finally, um, in Umber Majid's Trans Pakistan Zindabad, the protocols of movement across borders, cultural identity, and tourism are unpacked in speculative designs, physical installations, and virtual environments that speak to urban spaces that have become heavily policed by state and neoliberal forces. The artist uses her own fam familial heritage, her uncle ran a travel agency in Pakistan, uh, to understand the effects of diaspora and perhaps point to a new kind of reclaimed agency for migrants and persecuted Pakistanis alike. We see the post-colonial identity of South Asian visual culture expanded here, and the artist is really trying to understand how these visual forms affect and change us. The phenomenology of the global South, which occupies its own sort of protocol that is rooted in nostalgia, in nostalgia escapism, and exoticism. We hope that you guys enjoy the exhibition, uh, which, if all goes according to plan, might offer a toolkit for you to rethink the protocols that surround you. We may live in a simulation inside of a simulation, but I honestly believe that we all have the power to make an impact on the system. Thank you very much.